CEO Chris Orlob says 99% of account executives, SDRs, and business owners believe that effective cold email is about sharpening the message and desired outcome, or describing what you do and how you do it. But he says they're wrong. Here's what Chris says the top 1% of cold emails do differently. I'm curious to hear if you agree. Number one, they agitate pain. Number two, they create a compelling chain of sentences. Number three, they read like a page in your buyer's journal. Number four, they have an easy to say yes to call to action. Let's take these one at a time. Number one, agitate pain. I definitely don't promote the idea of pushing pains because the moment that we start thinking of describing the other side's pain, we tend to slip into a persuasive mindset and persuasion pushes people away. But let's hear Chris out here. He says, successful cold emails describe the pain better than the prospect can. Now, that's not the same thing as promising an outcome, he says, because they aren't thinking about outcomes yet. They're thinking about the thorn in their side. Play on that thorn and you will earn the right to have them read the next sentence. I do agree with Chris, but how you play on that thorn can be tricky. Beware of persuasive or condescending tone. For example, telling people about their pain by giving them information that they already know is a common condescending tee up to a premature meeting request. Another is quoting third party research findings as a means to persuade them that they have a problem. Now, if you're interested in learning more about how I recommend you frame this carefully, leave a comment below. Number two, create a compelling chain of sentences. Chris says every sentence that you write in a cold email has one purpose, to get them to read the next sentence. The only exception to this rule is the last sentence. If a sentence doesn't accomplish this, strike it. Pretend that you get $100 for every word that you remove. Get ruthless. Wow. I can rarely get behind advice handed out by self-appointed experts on LinkedIn, but Chris is clearly speaking from experience. Every word counts, and every sentence of your email or a LinkedIn message or your voicemail script needs to give them a specific reason to wonder what you're going to say next. Each sentence should build more curiosity. So I completely align with Chris on that. Number three, Chris says, effective cold emails read like a page in your buyer's personal journal. He says, as the potential customer scans your email, the way that you capture the pain should feel like a conversation that they are already having with themselves. You know, that little voice inside their head. He says, the best of the best cold emails get this response. Damn, that puts words to something that I've been struggling to articulate for a long time. Or in the case of a facilitative question, the customer might think, damn, I've never asked myself that question, but I should be. This is the power of asking customers questions that they should be asking themselves, but most likely are not. It tends to provoke curiosity about what the next sentence will say. Now, if you're interested in learning more about facilitative questions, leave a comment below. Okay, back to Chris, who says, number four, effective cold emails have an easy to say yes to call to action. Chris says, the best cold emails are easy to say yes to. Well, okay, but in our experience, some of the best cold emails leave the customer wanting more details. The email or voicemail creates an itch scratches the itch, but then doesn't over scratch it. The itch kind of remains. And of course, the customer knows what to do. Naturally, they just respond, they engage. So Chris says the best cold emails don't ask for 30 minutes. That's just too hard to say yes to for any busy executive. Basically, the best emails don't explicitly ask for time. He says they reference the problem and ask if it's worth having a conversation to explore fixing it. Again, 
I would leave out the part where you ask if it's worth having a conversation to explore fixing it because your message should be aimed at people who are most likely to want to fix it and they know what to do when they hear your provocation. That's just good targeting. They don't need to be told to respond. They respond because your message genuinely provoked them. They become curious to know more, to know the details, and really any form of asking, are you interested in speaking or hearing more, tends to lower your already low status. You are the one reaching out, so obviously you are the needy one. What we want to do is instead match their status level by not amplifying your state of need. This puts us on the even keel with your potential customer, okay? Over to you, what do you think about Chris's advice? See you down in comments, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more tips on helping people become curious enough to engage with you. All the best.